And we already have our last um, speaker of today's session, uh, Mr. Florindi Francesco. Good afternoon, everyone. Hello. It's it's nice to have you also in the session of patient centricity and patient advocacy. So he, um, he is a strategic partnership manager, uh, predictive genomics in Thermo Fisher currently. Uh, and he also uh, has been a part of BBMRI ERIC for, for a long time. Uh, and Francesco is going to talk about personalized medicine and building bridges among patients, researchers, decision makers, and industry. The floor is yours. Would you share any slides? Uh, yes, Gargana. Thanks. Yes, I'm passing the presenting rights, and now you should be able to share the screen. Once again, it's a pleasure to have you. The pleasure is mine. I'm not going to speak Bulgarian. My wife is Bulgarian, and I always loved to come to 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 Biotech Adelier because to me it's a great uh, it's a great sign that uh, you know the whole southeastern European uh, uh, neighborhood uh, is is really powerful, is really um, a great place for innovation. It's where a lot of things can happen in the future. So uh, my pleasure to be here. Um, so my, uh, I'm going to try to talk today a little bit about uh, uh, this topic of personalized medicine. Uh, I'm not a scientist. I am a public affairs expert, uh, a lobbyist, if you want, uh, a good lobbyist. I work with patient organizations, um, with BBMRI, and now I'm a, a Thermo Fisher. Um, so um, science is political. We know that. We learned that the hard way through the pandemic. Uh, it shows us how really powerful and, 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 and political each statement, each little, uh, you know, uh, scientific issue can become. Um, and you heard, of course, from, from, from Antonella, from Peter, from all the other um, patient advocates here, the implications of, of the, you know, participating with, with patients and, and how crucial is that. So today uh, I'm going to try to, to argue with you, to, to discuss with you, um, uh, that the, the next evolution, the, the vision of healthcare that's based on, on prevention, on personalized medicine, cannot happen but with a new social contract that's built between patients, citizens, industry, uh, healthcare professional, academia, uh, and all the partners. Um, uh, can, you can see my slides, correct? I take that as a yes. So, um, as I said, science is political. It's been 120 years that we have electricity, uh, but you all remember when 120 years ago it was introduced, um, all the criticism and, and the, the, the fake news that came out. Um, now, uh, it's not electricity that's being contested, it's social distancing, it's the vaccine that creates um, uh, uh, a torrid uh, uh, political uh, conversation. So I, I know that this slide might make you feel a little bit depressed, a little bit sad, because, you know, is it possible that uh, our societies have not changed in 120 years? Uh, I argue that actually they have, it's just that we're not looking at them uh, in the right way. Um, uh, as you know, the uh, uh, former Secretary of State of the United States, uh, uh, Robert McNamara, used to say, uh, you know, in God we trust, everyone else better bring data. So I had a look at the data we have to figure out if we, if our societies really have not changed since, since the, you know, when electricity was put together, when the criticism of a new innovation was coming out. And uh, I was lucky because I uh, put my hands, I had my hands on the latest Eurobarometer uh, study that was published uh, literally a few weeks ago by the European Commission that measures the citizens' attitude towards science and technology. Now, this is the most updated, um, um, largest uh, study we have on what people think about science and innovation. It comprehends more than 30, 37,000 respondents from all European countries. Um, so it's, it's really huge. Um, and, uh, you know, what's, what's the real picture right now? What's the real picture we get from this study? Uh, well, first and foremost, expectations are really high on health research. European citizens believe that science and technology play a crucial role 
and the vast majority of the respondents, as you see here, 47% across all the, uh, the demographics believe that uh, innovation uh, in health is a pivotal topic. So there is a lot of expectations. It's not just expectations, but also people care about science too. We've seen that through the pandemic, um, the, 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 the share of people looking for information on uh, health and science has dramatically increased. So this means that people really, uh, that the average population really has a growing interest for, for science. I need to underline that this, this data was collected through the pandemic between March and April this year. So really in the thick of the third or second wave, depending on where you're from. So high expectations from science and the fact that people care about science don't equate to health literacy. This must be very, very clear. This slide shows you that a third of European citizens still believe in conspiracies about the origin of the COVID vaccine. Um, I'm not gonna get into this topic <laughs> at all, but what I want to say is the fact that people care and the fact that people believe that health research is important does not mean that automatically they look for the right source of information. There's still a lot of inf misinformation, there's still a lot of uh, uh, fake news, uh, and health literacy remains one of the biggest gaps, uh, uh, in my opinion, for patients to actually um, access the right uh, healthcare for themselves. Finally, we also see that Europeans want science to be, to be ruled, to be governed by ethics rather than by innovation. Now, if you dig into the data, you see there's actually a big spectrum between Latin countries, Southern countries, where they want ethics and, and policy to have a prominent role, more, more of a prominent role in, in, in uh, governing science versus the Nordics, where it's more innovation driven. But the average still shows a, a clear um, uh, preference of European citizens to look at science, to, to govern science in an ethical way. This means that no innovation, no matter the field, is free from a political impact. So if I sum up the, the, the results of this study, uh, we can see that you know, people have high expectations from health research, growing health, uh, growing expectations thanks to the pandemic. They care and follow what happens in the lab, but they don't get the right uh, uh, type of information often. Uh, people are still conservative and um, if you want, if you don't want to use the word conservative, you can use, you know, socially conscious, ethically conscious. They want a uh, healthcare innovation, a scientific innovation that is ethically uh, uh, okay. That's, that's that's okay from an ethical perspective. And we understand that whatever the innovation out there, it will bump. It it, it will um, have an political impact of some sort. Now that I introduced you, let's say on on this background which is a picture of the reality today, uh, not just of patients, but really of citizens across Europe. On this background, I want to introduce a, a vision of healthcare that is based on groundbreaking innovation and check with you if this would be implementable today. You know, what would be the impact of this innovation? And the innovation I'm talking about is of course, predictive genomics. Uh, so we know that 25% of health outcomes, be it positive or negative, uh, so being, you know, remaining healthy or getting sick depends on genomics. Um, but we're not really acting upon it in, on, a, on, a pub, on a public level scale. Um, I imagine a world where, you know, what if every citizen would have a personalized disease risk model to find out the best way to keep them healthy rather than developing a disease and having to cure it, become, becoming a patient. So this is, so solving this, this question and answering this question of mine is the promise of predictive genomics to move healthcare systems from a sick, uh, taking care of the sick of, of patients from a, you know, curing the, the sick to preserving health. And how does it do that? It does that via two, uh, let's say, uh, uh, big, big instruments that we have at our, at our disposal. Um, so that is the next slide. Um, 
polygenic risk scores and pharmacogenomics. Now, I'm not going to get technical here also because, again, I'm not the right speaker for this. But we know that polygenic risk scores and pharmacogenomics, they both um, take information from our genome to identify, first, in the case of polygenic risk scores, uh, which diseases could um, uh, are we more susceptible to be um, to be getting through our years? Well, how high is the risk of us developing a certain disease through the years? Pharmacogenomics uses a similar set of data to figure out what would be our response to a certain drugs. Now, I don't have to underline how impactful this would be, for example, for cancer patients, given the high level of toxicity of these of these drugs. So, um, this all in, in theory, this all sounds great. So why doesn't this happen on a wide scale? I believe that doesn't, this doesn't happen, first and foremost, from for an economic perspective. Um, governments are not spending, let's say, are not allocating sufficient resources to preventive care. Um, the slides here show you the raw numbers. You know how much money uh, the governments, what percentage of the GDP governments are are allocating to to healthcare. And you see, in Europe, thanks to our social healthcare systems, is an important uh, budget line at the state level, at the governmental level. However, that important budget line does not translate in an important budget for preventive care. On average, in Europe, we spend around three percent of the healthcare budget in prevention. This is not sufficient, clearly not sufficient, you know, uh, even to run campaigns uh, against obesity or against, uh, you know, uh, smoke prevention, tobacco uh, use and so on. That these, these programs have been, uh, have been successful, but the, with the funding available, 3% three, 3 or less, this is really not enough. If we want to include uh, the vision of, of preventive genomics that I just showed you, that, that budget is definitely not, not uh, sufficient. But then what am I talking about? Is it just uh, you know, a theory or a thermal pitch? No, this is actually the reality. There are, we know of countries that have implemented such vision of preventive genomics and, uh, and it's, it's working. It shows, it shows great results. I'm sharing here one from Taiwan. We know it well because we help the Taiwan researchers to develop, but there are also examples in Europe, for example, Finjan uh, or, or, or Estonia, again, great examples. Let me, let me walk you through this slide and show you that how preventive genomics could work and how is it working right now in Taiwan. It started, of course, as a research project. Uh, that's where Thermo Fisher excels at, at supporting science. Um, uh, the, uh, the Taiwan Precision Medicine Initiative is uh, uh, enrolling millions of patients, millions of citizens, uh, analyzing their genome and including that data of their genome in their health uh, electronic health records um, uh, really at country scale. So there are more than 15 hospitals uh, participating. The patients, when they, they join, the, you know, they enter the hospital, they're automatically consented. They ask if they want to enroll in the, in the, uh, in the study. Uh, this ensures a high, very high level of, of uh, uh, buy-in from the patients as well, because the patient, the doctors and the nurses are trained to provide, you know, to get an informed consent that it's really based on an understanding of, of the whole study. And um, um, I'm happy to share, if you're interested more about this, uh, several scientific papers that, that are coming up more and more from the scientific, from, from TPMI, that show that indeed pharmacogenomics, polygenic risk scores can be implemented at the clinical level and have an impact uh, uh, in this specific case on the Taiwanese population. So large preventive genomic programs are possible. Um, these, these programs are groundbreaking, um, but they're not gonna happen without the support and the understanding of patients and citizens, because they are the ones holding the key. Um, not just in, I, I underlined here the, the, the consent clearly, because that is something you know, post GDPR, uh, our patient advocate, advocate world has been, you know, all of a sudden uh, the consent becomes because an issue. It was an issue before. Um, but this slide is going to show you that really all the partners need to be involved, not just as partners, but really as co-creators to make sure that large 
generational, really um, uh, groundbreaking innovation can happen. Um, so what's the patient's role? First and foremost, consent, clearly. They need to be involved and understand what goes on. Patient organizations are crucial there, not just to um, understand the content of these consent forms, but really helping shape the very design of the, of the study. Um, the government plays a key role, uh, not just in funding, but also in ensuring that the infrastructure is there uh, to implement, the, not you know, to transform research into clinical action um, without a working electronic health records, without a working clinical infrastructure. We can study all we want. We can do the, you know, we can map the genome of the whole population, but that's not gonna have an impact. It has to be embedded from the start and for that, the only player who can do that is really the government um, in partnership with academia. And academia is important because, again, they are the ones that not just uh, um, developing the, the techniques, but also uh, the ones that uh, play a key role in understanding the technology and using it in a proper way. So as you see, the, in Europe, I believe, you know, look, think of your own country. I believe the ingredients are there in your country to achieve, let's say, such a vision of healthcare. The problem is that the players, as I highlighted here, are they playing the same game? Are they talking in the same direction? I don't think so. I know for a fact that that's not happening. Now, you could use this model, this way of thinking uh, across any health innovation you might think of. You know, it could be diagnostics, it could be access to new medicines, it could be um, uh, artificial intelligence. That, that's not the, let's say, the, the, I'm happy to talk about what we know at uh, Thermo Fisher, that is predictive genomics, but this way of thinking of creating a partnership across all the parties, um, it's the right methodology to, to make it happen. So um, um, that's it from me. Um, I cannot highlight uh, how uh, interesting it was for me to uh, be able to put these thoughts together uh, not just for, for, for you, for Biotech Atelier, of course, but also for, for uh, internally, for ourselves, because industry, you know, uh, particularly, uh, particularly when it comes to medical devices uh, uh, or, or support to scientific research, as Thermo Fisher does, um, uh, we might appear sometimes a bit far from the patients. That, that could not be further from the truth. It, it is not true. But at the same time, we need to show that uh, we have this type of thinking in our heads. And, uh, and then I, I'm happy to keep working hard with you to make sure that not just Thermo, but really the whole industry compartment can, can be closer to the patients. It can make sure that uh, um, true co-creation can happen uh, at the use scale. Thanks for your time and uh, happy to answer all your questions. Thank you, Francesco. It was a great presentation and thank you for touching the topic of prevention because we are all talking about personalized medicine, but but uh, prevention is, is usually not the focus, unfortunately. Uh, so uh, I have a question uh, regarding this shift from treatment to prevention is typical for personalized medicine, but are, are the key stakeholders prepared for this uh, new concept? Yes, they are. I mean, Peter, I P Peter, now come on. I, uh, maybe I'm biased because I've been lucky to work for, uh, for ECPC uh, and, uh, and in and around the patient organizations for the better part of a decade now. So I can, uh, I strongly encourage whoever asks the question, get in contact with me. I'm happy to put you in contact with patients in your in your uh, patient expert patients, patient advocates in your in your region who can uh, uh, who can get uh, uh, let's say who can show you that they're really able. Um, that's not enough though, because again, as I showed you with my slides, you know, while we have expert patients, real superstar people who know uh, and understand science, uh, working for patients. The general population is not there. It's clearly not there. Uh, so more efforts on, on health literacy should be done. Um, and this is really, then, then we go back to the governments. You know, what is the priority here? Is it the priority to, to um, spend money on ineffective treatments or to keep people healthy? If 
the priority is to keep keep people healthy, um, then we really need to see governments moving budget, move, allocate funding to to increase health literacy across the board. Uh, I, I want to I want to share one other like one data point that I I found it shocking, uh, but it's always uh, uh, good to keep it in mind. Um, uh, this is, I believe, WHO information. 50%, 15, 15.5% of our health outcomes is determined by the treatment we get. So, you know, you're sick, you get the vaccine, that accounts for 15%. Yet we spend 97% of the healthcare budget on that to get 15% of outcome. I'm not an economist, I'm not a scientist, numbers are not my thing, but that doesn't sound like a good deal. Indeed, indeed. Uh, and here I have one more question in the chat, so I was just going to read it. How is the Body Life for Health Organization cancer arm pushing for prevention, yet only 3% is allocated to prevention? Why are they not aligned? So if I understand well, the, the, the question is about again about the budgets, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, truth to be told, um, innovations like the one I showed you right now, preventive genomics based on microarray technology, that's Thermo Fisher thing, um, is proving to be effective, but it's still in research phase. So we're, we're really looking at the future right now. Eh? Um, few countries have shown that this can happen, that can work, but there are many technical details that need to be ironed out. My experience is that uh, um, it, it has to be, uh, governance needs to be nudged in the right direction, coming from multiple directions. And I, I was doing that when I was patient advocate, and we were working a lot on access to medicine, on access to innovative drugs, which is, of course, extremely, from a political perspective, this is extremely, I can say, um, uh, it's one of the priorities right now. We've seen plenty of action happening at the, at the highest political level. Think of the Oslo Initiative, if you heard about that. And now, right now, even the WHO is 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 working act proactively to to ensure access to innovative medicine across the European region. So that's the the hot topic right now. I don't see why genomic pre preventive genomics cannot become the hot topic. I call on patient organizations. To, um, I mean, they have a tough work to do to take care of the patients. So I, I know how tough it is. But should you have some spare capacity, I think it's time for a patient organization to also, you know, advocate a little bit to work on prevention. And it's tough to work on prevention for a patient organization. I know that well. Um, but I believe that we are we are getting very close to the technical solutions that would allow population-wide um, uh, programs, like the one I showed you before, they can really have a huge impact also on the patients. So, um, yeah, I'm calling on them to help, uh, you know, to help spell the, you know, uh, share share the, the information. And as usual, my, my you can find me on LinkedIn, you can find me on Twitter. I'm always available to share information uh, on this topic and uh, um, and get you on board. Perfect, perfect. And I have in the chat an informal invitation to join in prior to leave initiatives and uh, focused on cancer uh, in the direction of prevention. So we will keep in touch for sure. Looking forward. Either. So in case there are no other questions, comments, uh, I will take the liberty to close today's session that started at Probably it was 10 o'clock in Central European time. Yeah, so it was a long day, but so perfect one. Thank you for the fantastic uh, talk, uh, for all topics touched today. And I believe that this is not the end, it's just the beginning of uh, something else, something new, and something productive uh, for, for the care of patients because each page, patient matters. Goodbye, Dovishtana from Klausi Sofia, and take care, stay safe and healthy. Bye bye. Bye. That was a fantastic presentation, Francesco. Thank you. Bye bye.
Oh, thanks, Pierre. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.